welcome to, to today's webinar. As um, Ajay mentioned, I work in the training team at Embol EBI. Um, we have here that it's an introduction for um, teachers and trainers. Uh, I'm sure many of you are teachers and trainers. That's great. There's going to be loads of information in here for you, hopefully. If you're not, um, don't worry. There's still going to be lots of um, important and useful information about EBI resources and the training that you can um, you can use yourself that I'm sure will be very useful. Um, if he hasn't already, Ajay is going to drop the link for my slides into the chat. So um, there are plenty of links throughout these slides. It may be useful for uh, for some of you to be able to look at, look at the slides yourself. Um, so that should be there for you now. So uh, Ajay mentioned a bit about what we're going to talk about this afternoon, but to go into slightly more detail. I am going to talk a little bit about um, e Embol EBI. Hopefully, you you probably all know a bit already because you wanted to come to this webinar. But I'll uh, I'll cover a bit on that. I'll then go into um, a little detail on EBI data resources, um, including searching for data, data submission, that kind of thing, and then cover some um, training content and materials that we have available for you, as well as um, how to get some help. And then I will hand over to. Um, ben and Summer for a bit on Ensemble and Europe PMC, respectively. So when we talk about um, Embly BI, uh, we're talking about one of the, um, the the parts of the European Molecular Biology Lab Laboratory, EMBL, and EBI is the bioinformatics um, base for EMBL. So uh, we are located in, um, in England near Cambridge, and we are one of six sites um, that EMBOR has across Europe. We are the, the complete, completely uh, computational, whereas the other five include some um, wet labs as well. We have a num um, many European member states. So these are the countries which contribute to the, um, the running of, uh, of EMBOR. Um, but this very much isn't uh, just those people, those countries that use our resources. EBI resources are used very much by um, people right across the world. Um, and if you're interested, you can go and check out this live map to see um, where in the world EBI resources are being used right at this moment. So in terms of what uh, Embol EBI does, um, we have um, missions that kind of takes five parts. So we're very much um, in uh, delivering data resources, and that's that's a big part of what we do. And I'm going to go into that much more in just a moment. Uh, we do research at the EBI. We um, do a lot of training, as mentioned, part of the training team. That's a big focus that we have. And I, that's another part I'm going to go into later on in this uh, talk. We also work with industry and um, coordinate uh, some bioinformatics right across Europe. So in terms of the data resources that um, Embol EBI actually offers, the, these are very varied and uh, cross a, num a large number of um, life sciences domains. And so I just wanted to take a bit of time to, to run through some of these because I'm sure there are many that um, will be completely new or perhaps you don't know are, are linked to the EBI in any way. So starting off on, on the left here, we have um, resources that are associated with chemical biology. So in particular, uh, we have um, Kebby and Kemble that are looking at um, chemical uh, molecules, metabolites, it's metabolomics, um, and then moving across to genes and genomes. We have Ensemble, which I'm sure many of you have heard of and used before. Um, uh, we have expression data for Array Express and uh, Expression Atlas. Um, right through to RNA in RNA central uh, and nucleotide data in the ENA. When it comes to proteins, if it's just a case of, of looking for a bit of information on proteins, we have Uniprot as a first place for many people to go to. Um, we also have protein structures in the PDBE, mass spectrometry data in PRIDE. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are well aware of um, one of the most recent databases, AlphaFold, where we have predicted protein structures. And then we have another um, fairly new um, resource as well in, in the imaging column of the Bioimage Archive. And uh, we actually have a, a course that's hopefully coming soon on the Bioimage Archive for you to, to learn more about. But this is a, a place to store many different types of biological da um, image data. Then moving to genetic variation, 
Um, we have the, the COVID-19 data platform, which obviously popped up a couple of years ago with, with large amounts of COVID data. The uh, EVA for variation data, we have mouse informatics, um, as well as the, the EGA. So that's looking at um, genome phenome data. And the reason I've added a little star to that is to remind me to mention that all of these data resources are completely free and open or completely open, except um, EGA, the European Genome Phenome Archive, is the one exception to that. This is because it has sensitive um, clinical patient data. It doesn't mean that you are unable to access this kind of data, but what it does mean is that if you go to the EGA website, you'll be able to see um, some metadata, some information about the, the data that's available. But to actually get that patient data, that sensitive data, you do have to apply for access. And as a, as a researcher, you could apply for that kind of access, provided you had a, a, a reason to do so. And um, there's all sorts of details about on on the EJ website about how to access that data. But as I mentioned, all the rest are, are completely open. And then at this final column, um, we have the uh, literature and knowledge management resources, which obviously covers a lot of things. But um, we have, for example, Europe PMC, the literature database, um, GWAS catalog for genome wide association data, biomodels for mathematical model data, um, as well as protein protein interactions in intact. Um, and uh, Reactome Pathways Database. So I've spent quite a bit on time on this slide, but really I just wanted to emphasize how many different resources across such broad variety and um, areas of life sciences that we do have resources for. In terms of species, it's not just human. Some databases do focus on human, but for many, there are many different, um, many different species. So do check out um, what's actually available. And all of these data resources that I've mentioned don't work in a vacuum. They're not siloed. There are many different interactions between each of these resources. And this um, image here just gives a, an indication of how some of these resources do connect to each other. So, for example, if you're looking for a protein, you might go to Uniprot, but then a link from Uniprot might lead you to the protein structure and PDBE and so on. So these resources really do kind of interact with each other to, to try and help you find the kind of data that you're looking for. Um, these are also not all run solely by the EBI. Many of these databases or, and uh, resources are collaborations. Um, these collaborations can work in different ways. So to give an example, um, the protein data bank in Europe is, is one that's run by the EBI, but there are also other protein data banks. There's one coming out of America, there's a PDBJ from Japan. Um, and the data that's used, the, the basis for these, all three of these resources is, is the same, but the um, the interfaces and the tools are slightly different um, between each of these. So you, whilst you're still accessing the same data, there may be a preference for you for the, the resource that you access them from. So where does this data actually come from? Um, and it, it's probably not surprising to hear it comes from researchers, right? So researchers all around the world are producing data and it all end, well, and much of it ends up in in these data resources, and it does so in different ways. So some of the resources have bio curators who curate literature, looking for um, looking for data to to populate uh, the resource websites with, and others is submitted directly from um, researchers, often working with. Um, by curators who work in the background of these resources to ensure that their data has the um, the correct and suitable metadata, the so data that's describing the data, to um, to add accurately and um, completely describe the data to to go on on these various resource websites. Um, I mentioned by curators there. Um, this is something that uh, comes up a bit when we start talking about EBI data resources. Um, this is a, a a role that changes depending on which resource they work for but these are people who are working in the background um, of these resources to make sure that the the data is there in, in usable ways that people can use the data that they can submit uh, accurately lots of different roles for for bio curators there but it's um something we we have a lot of people working on they're also the people who you go to um when you uh contact one of the, the resources via the website to, to get some help. Um, perhaps you want to understand a bit more about how you can use some data, how to, to submit that kind of thing. Those are the bio curators there in the background to help you do that. 
So when we're talking about um, getting data from researchers or from um, from published uh, publications, um, that's then the submit part of this data cycle that I'm showing here. Um, once data has been submitted to one of these resources, it is essentially archived, so it's being kept somewhere. Um, it's then often classified or analysed by um, these uh, resources and shared being one of the main parts of it. Um, and then further, um, because it's made available online for, for anyone to access, it can then be further analysed by other re researchers who are um, related to the data, who can just find it on, on these various websites um, and used to sort of develop uh, their research and, and their learning um, and any any analyses that they're doing. Um, so we kind of thought uh, forming this uh, data cycle here, um, but the uh, the big part of it that we kind of like to to highlight in the middle there is the sharing, the getting the data to other people around the world. So that's a, a brief introduction to, to what kind of resources the EBI actually has to offer. Um, and it's great if you know which resource that you're interested in, but often that's not the case. So if you um, would like to find out some uh, some information about, for example, a gene or a protein, and you don't know where to start, going straight to ebi.ac.uk, the homepage, is a really good place to start. Um, because you will see at the top of the homepage for the EBI website, uh, is a big search box and there you can put in your gene protein chemical anything you like um, and hit the search button um, and as a result you will see lots of information listed about that uh, gene or protein um, you can't see it down the, the whole of it down the side because i had to cut it off at some point but there's lots of different types of results that you can then reduce your search for and i think um, this is one one really great place to start if you're trying to um, and teach the role of of data resources and what kind of data is out there to just come straight to the the EBI um, homepage and, and just start looking and, and looking through the results of a, a search like this to try and understand what's out there because what it will then do is lead you onto a specific data resource once you've found an element of of uh, information that you're looking for so in this case it's it's led me to ensemble where there's a huge amount of, of information about this gene but there's also further links as well, which will take me to, to other resources. And it's a, a really good way of understanding how these um, how these information actually interact with each other. Um, if you don't want to go in that way, but you have an idea about a data resource you're looking for, just uh, below the search box on the front page is this Find Data Resource link here. And that will take you to our list of resources. And from there, you can filter down to try and find more about what you're looking for. Or if you have an idea about the uh, the type of data or the name of the resource, you can also look there or, sort of, or uh, use the filters to perhaps look for all the, the protein related resources, for example. Um, and that's a way of, sort of limiting uh, what you're looking for. So you can go straight to that resource rather than looking through lots of uh, results for a, a gene or protein if you're kind of looking a bit more broadly than that. One thing I, I briefly want to mention, and I, I won't stay here long, but um, is about programmatic access or APIs. Um, so this, um, for example, is if uh, you're trying to access the data, not via the, the browser and not via the, the website, but um, access programmatically. So, for example, if you're trying to put together um, an analysis pipeline and you want part of that to go and grab some data from one of these resources and, and bring it back, um, to your script, then um, programmatic access is uh, what you'd be looking for. Um, all the data resources that have a, an API or a way of accessing the data programmatically um, include it on their um, as, as part of the, the tabs at the top usually, so you'll be able to find that. Um, but also we have on the training site um, lots of information about accessing different resources programmatically, um, and there's a uh, what we call an online tutorial that covers many of these things and there's lots of, of videos um, one for each resource if there's something in particular you're looking for um, if it's uh, something around data submission that you might be interested in uh, you can come back to the home page and, and check out this box here which will actually lead you on to a data submission wizard and this would 
based on a couple of questions that it asks, gives you an idea about the kind of um, resource you can submit your data to and give you a bit of information to, uh, about how to do that. Uh, in terms of why people may want to submit data, um, open science is, is obviously um, a thing we talk about a lot, but um, in terms of being able to share your data with others, to, uh, to get the visibility of your data out there is really important. Um, the, the data that you're using um, will often be used to answer a specific question that you have about your research, um, but it can also be used by others uh, potentially to ask questions that you may not have thought about. And so it's it's, it's really um, so useful to be able to put that data out there in a way that other people can find it. Um, but the, the big thing to mention as well is becoming more and more common for for journals and funders to request that data is um, submitted openly when published. Um, and so that's something that can be done hand in hand um, with publishing in a journal. Okay, in terms of um, training uh, and support, I just wanted to, to give a brief overview of the kind of training that the EBI offers. And this is going to include a lot about materials as well. So that's um, materials that other, other trainers, other teachers can use for themselves. So if you come to the EBI training site, which is uh, linked again from this slide, um, and scroll down very slightly from the top, you will see these three elements. Um, we are first talking about live training and the webinars uh, such as this one are part of that live training so it has a specific time that happens um, and as part of that I say webinars but also our face-to-face -face courses and I'm going to come back to those in just a moment. Our on-demand training is the kind of uh, training materials that is there available on the website anytime that's for anyone to come along and use in any way they want um, and and that's something that's it's not time restricted um, there's no restrictions at that all it's just always there for anyone and openly accessible so to go into a bit more um, about those sections the uh, as I mentioned you're already at one of the webinars so obviously you know a little bit about that um, but we cover a really wide range of topics. Um, some of them are much more introductory. So um, last year we ran a series that um, was introducing different uh, EBI resources in each webinar to a, a more beginner audience. Um, sometimes we focus more on programmatic access, as I mentioned, and sometimes we, we like to aim for very specific audiences. So, for example, later this year, we're going to be running a quite a large series focusing on plant biology and bioinformatic tools that plant biologists um, can focus on. Um, so it really does vary quite a lot and check uh, back onto the website um, and you will see uh, new webinars being made available for registration very frequently. Uh, they tend to be on a, on a Wednesday as this is, um, but there is a bit of variation on that. So do keep an eye on, on what's coming up. In terms of our on-demand um, training, we generally are uh, covering four different types here, and I'm just going to go briefly into those four different types. Um, to start with, we have the recorded webinars. So every webinar we do is recorded and is made um, openly available. So if you're not able to attend the webinar in person or you want to share a recording with students or with colleagues, um, you can absolutely do that. They usually appear, appear on our website uh, within 24 hours of the webinar um, happening. Um, and those are all there openly available. Um, you will see a view recording uh, button and clicking that will take you straight to the recording to watch um, but there'll also be an access materials button as well and that will allow you to download the slides and again use in, in whatever way you would like to do so and so here's the example of uh, of just that so we have the the watch video which will take you off to view um, or indeed the access materials button there and I just wanted to highlight that once you've gone through to this watch video button here, once you click through on that, you will get taken to the um, the video, the recording, but it is also possible to download recordings. And I know that um, it's important for some to be able to access offline, so you can actually download um, each of the webinar recordings there as well. 
We also have um, many, many different online tutorials um, available. And by that, we mean a sort of self-paced uh, mini course that people can work through in their own time. Um, and these really do cover a wide range um, of topics. So it could be as we've got here, the introduction to the science of bioinformatics, what we call bioinformatics for the terrified, um, or for example, introducing a um, EBI resource and, and getting people up and running so that they can use the resource um, for themselves. Or even in fact, on a more general topics um, in, uh, in life sciences and bioinformatics. So here's one on uh, human genetic variation and, and introducing topics in that. We also have what we call collections, and these are collections of e-learning that focus on a specific topic. So if you have an idea about a topic that you're interested in, but you're not quite sure how to start or you don't know which um, uh, recording or online tutorial to go for, then check out one of these collections and it will get you started in that. So there's a, a few examples here. So um, the most recent on biostatistics, and this is a really hands-on um, way of getting into learning about bio, biostatistics. There's lots of, um, uh, sort of um, interactive workbooks to, to try out there, or indeed doing things like um, using publicly available data to get people started in doing just that. So these are, these are very introductory to start with, but take people into quite a bit more detail as, as you work through. And as I mentioned, we also have face-to-face -face and virtual courses. So up until now, um, all of the, the training that I've mentioned is completely open, um, openly accessible, available to anyone. Um, the face-to-face -face and virtual courses are sort of um, usually week-long courses that focus on a particular uh, topic. These have a limited number of places, usually 30. Um, and they um, do have a cost associated with them. So this is, is restricted in that um, we not everyone can attend these, they do have a cost, but um, we do make all our materials from our live face-to-face -face, um, virtual courses openly available. And, and this is something that I think particularly relevant for, for teachers, for trainers. We have our materials, so that could be recordings, but Often it is um, slides from lectures and practical um, session documents. So um, sort of help to help people work through practicals, um, which can be really useful to repurpose. And you will notice as I've gone through this, um, everything has had a an overview to give you an idea about what it's uh, what it's about, but also learning outcomes to go along with those, so that you can get an idea about what it really will cover and and what. Um, what people can hope to achieve by the end of completing that webinar recording or online tutorial or whatever it is. I just wanted to also mention a bit about um, some functionality that we have on the website to help people keep track of their learning. So if you go to the EBI training site, you will notice um, at the top there is a login and register button. Um, it is not at all necessary to log in or to register for the site to use any of this um, training content materials. It's all completely open, as I've said. Um, but if you would like to, to register for the site, what it does is allows you to track um, progress or mark, as, as you can see here, mark as favorite to keep, um, keep track of, of uh, courses or recordings that you're interested in. Um, and you can see as well here that it's tracking my progress through this online tutorial. Um, and keeps track of, of how far I've gone and takes me back into the, the right place if I want to go back to it. It also gives me this My Learning page where it lists the things I've favorited, um, courses I've started and those that I've completed. So it, it helps people keep track. Okay, so I just wanted to mention a few more specific things on um, supporting you in your teaching and training. Um, so as I've kind of mentioned a number of times already, uh, all our materials are freely available for, for you to explore, but also to adapt in whatever way you want to do. Um, so, for example, you, you may just want to take a small subsection of one of our, our recordings to use in your teaching. You may want to use a few slides. All of that's perfectly fine. Um, and we're really hoping that the, the site will um, be there as well to give you some inspiration about different topics in, in bioinformatics that you may want to, to teach on. 
Um, and and these uh, different materials and different um, self-paced courses that I've mentioned could be used in different ways. So, for example, it may be that you want to to use them in your own teaching, or perhaps to to be given as as homework or pre pre session work um, to students to do directly, and that's all possible. Um, I also really wanted to make sure that we're all clear on the licensing of these materials that we have available. They're all coming under a CC BY license, so the Creative Commons license there. You'll see this um, on all our pages there. It's listed. Um, if you click this, it, it takes you through to a page about the CC BY license. But essentially what it means is um, you can use, adapt, do whatever you like with these materials, but just as long as you say where it came from. And that's the, the BY element of the CC BY license. But you're very welcome to adapt, to translate, to, to do whatever it is you would like to do with them. One thing that we do also have available um, outside the EBI site is a Zenodo repository related to EBI training. Um, and so if you do adapt or create your own materials related to EBI resources and you would like to share those with others, this is the facility to do that. So you're very welcome to upload um, your materials to this repository. This is in no way necessary if you just want to adapt and create your own resources that's in relation to, to the EBI resources, that's absolutely fine if you want, don't want to share those. But if you do, um, this is the, the place to do so. So for example, if you um, took some of our slides and, and translated them into another language, maybe that's useful to other people. Um, and by uploading them to this Zenodo community, um, you would be able to, to share them in that way. So I've got the, the link to the community there, but I've also added uh, the train online link, which will, sorry, email. Um, which will come to, to us if you have any questions about using this repository. If you're maybe not sure about contributing or you want a bit more information, you can you can get that by, by emailing us at this email address. So the last thing I wanted to do uh, was just to highlight a few um, more introductory um, self-paced tutorials that I think might be of interest to to some of you. Um, so the first one is the collection on introductory bioinformatics. So this is quite a lot of e-learning around um, getting started in bioinformatics, understanding a bit more about um, the background, but also a bit about um, EBI and a few of the data resources as well. So it's quite, quite a nice place to start. Um, another one I wanted to highlight was uh, an online tutorial around data management, and um, I think it's something that can be quite difficult to to get get into to the depths of when you're when you're training or teaching on this. Um, but obviously, data management is so essential in life sciences, um, re regardless of of the level people are working at, um, and this covers um, what data management is, the benefits and challenges of sharing data, going into open science. Um, tools for data management, looking at data management plans, and then going through to things like data standards. So I think there's a, a lot of information in this one that will be very useful for, for anyone working in the life sciences. And also we have a bit of an introduction to EBI resources through this a Journey Through Bioinformatics tutorial as well. And this is one I really wanted to highlight, not just because it's, it's um, useful in its introductory nature, but also because um, we have a modified version that can be used for face-to-face -face teaching. Um, so this is a, a sort of a treasure hunt, if you will, um, which gives people challenges. And then um, in this version that I've got highlighted here, it's um, a couple of PowerPoints where one of the PowerPoints has the challenges and the second one has the um, answers as well as some hints to, to to allow you to help people um, work their way through this. So if you're looking for a more interactive um, introduction to EBI resources, I recommend this one. Um, uh, so these are the few that I just wanted to highlight, but if you go to the EBI training uh, front page, you will see a search box that will help you find what you're looking through, looking for. Um, so you can plug in a term and find some training related to that and then restrict to the, to the the type of training as well. If there's something, for example, if you're looking for materials or a, a recording, you can do so there. 
Um, one thing I just wanted to, to highlight towards the end here is that all our online tutorials and materials have one of these feedback forms and it's really useful for us um, if you can uh, tell us um, a bit about how you're using it and, and if you have something that you think would uh, be useful to improve or to change in some way, then um, this is a great way of letting us know about that. Um, in terms of getting help on EBI resources, there uh, are lots of these, for example, help um, sections at the top of various of web, different EBI resource websites, um, but also as well, if you check out the support and feedback um, button on the EBI homepage, you'll be able to then select the topic. And this could be, for example, training, or it could be um, a different resource. Uh, this is all something that you can pick from this list here. And there's there's always someone there to, to kind of help with your questions. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of ways about keeping up to date with the kind of training that we're offering. Um, I mentioned before about the facility to register and log into the site, to our training site, to um, keep track of your learning. But it's also possible to um, subscribe to our mailing list when you register as well. And essentially, we send out an email um, like this one on the right here once every other month so it's not coming very frequently but we highlight some things like the new webinars that we have coming up or new collections that we've just released and then we have various other ways to to stay in touch with us as well and to keep um, up to date on what we're offering so um, for example twitter and linkedin are, are really great ways of doing that um, and just the last thing for me there's a, a few webinars coming up soon um, and these three are all available for registration at the moment. Um, and I think with that, I will stop there and then hand over to Ben. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so yeah, just to introduce myself, um, my name is Ben Moore. Uh, I'm one of the members of the Ensemble Outreach Team. So many of you, um, as AJ mentioned, uh, might be familiar with Ensemble. Uh, Ensemble is a genome browser. Um, so the idea uh, of the resource that we have um, within Ensemble uh, is, um, a database that holds information about genome sequences and annotation. So we have lots of data around gene annotation, um, genetic variants and their association with phenotypes, for example, uh, as well as uh, the annotation of um, highly conserved regions and alignments uh, and orthologs, and then also regulatory features as well. Um, our sister project is called Ensemble Genomes, uh, where we have very similar data for non-vertebrate species. So we have Ensemble for vertebrates uh, and Ensemble Genomes for Non-Vertebrates. As one of the members of the Ensemble Outreach Team, um, I'm responsible for uh, providing user support for the Ensemble and Ensemble Genomes um, resources, uh, and then also providing um, our training program. So what I wanted to talk you through is the, the ways that you can either um, have Ensemble training, so either take Ensemble training yourself to learn more about the data that we have and the ways that you can access it, um, but also how we can give you some um, some information and resources if you want to deliver your own training about the Ensemble Genome Browser. So many of you may have visited the Ensemble um, website before, www.ensemble.org, um, but we actually also have a separate website um, that gives you information about our training events. So if you go to um, training.ensemble.org, and I can put that um, URL in the chat box for you, um, this will take you to a, a separate website that has information about all of our training events. So here you can see um, at the top, we have this blue bar um, that gives you information about our training materials from our upcoming courses and pre um, past courses as well. Uh, then we also have some materials for um, the, the courses that we have run in the past that you might want to use and adapt for your own training that you're, that you're hosting. Uh, and then we also have information about how you might want to invite us um, to, to host your own training at your own institute, um, and then also how you can attend Ensemble workshops. So the idea is that the Ensemble workshops that we deliver are completely free. Um, we hold them in both virtual and in-person formats. So you can either invite us to your institute um, in person. Uh, the workshops will be free, but we do require that you cover the cost of the travel and accommodation. So that might um depend on on your budgets and, and available uh, money in that regard um but we do also offer virtual training as well so if you want to invite us virtually we can provide a very similar workshop just obviously via um an online platform such as zoom 
If you want to get an idea of the types of workshops that we run, um, you can click on the training materials link here. Uh, and this will take you to a calendar of all of our training events. So you can see here that we have, um, these are our upcoming courses, um, some that have been running today, uh, and then also some later this week and next week as well, you can see, for example. So as an example, if we wanted to take a look at the workshop for the University of Nottingham next week, on the 24th of January, we can click here and we can begin to see all of the um, training materials that we put online in preparation for the course that's going to be delivered in person next week. So here you can see there's a link for a presentation. Uh, so this is the slide deck. Um, and then we also have a living document, which is a, a way that we can support and communicate with the participants of the course. Uh, and then at the bottom, we have this section called demos and exercises. So there's a menu here with each of the different modules for the workshop that's going to be delivered in Nottingham. Um, and if you click on one of them, for example, you can see that the are them given options to have a look at the demo, which is a hands on element during the workshop that we um, provide for students to um, get a, a taste for using Ensemble and to show them the main interfaces. Uh, and then we also have exercises as well. So here you can see the exercises that we ask that the students um, complete during the workshop. Uh, and then there's also text answer and a recorded video answer as well, showing you how we got the answer that we've provided here. So these workshops are obviously created and designed for individual workshops, uh, for individual universities and un individual institutes, um, but they're completely free and open and available for anyone to use and look at as well. So if you want to um, have a look at, you can come back to the um, training materials, have a look at our past events in the left hand side here from different years and also in the future you can actually look at the, the materials and either use them to learn yourself or you can integrate them into your own teaching as well if you want to at the top you can see that we have um, training exercises so if you click on the link here you'll see that we have a, a library of all of the exercises that we've created for previous um, ensemble workshops. Um, and these are sort of, um, these are presented in Google Doc format. So you can actually um, click on the links for these different exercises. And that will take you to a place where you can um, copy and paste these uh, exercises into your own training materials, obviously making sure that they're up to date and, and, in, and uh, relevant for your training. So you can see here that we've last updated this exercise here, for example, in Ensemble 104, which was actually released one or two years ago. So what you might want to do is obviously look at this, this look at this exercise and just check whether it works still and whether it's up to date based on the latest Ensemble release data. Uh, again, these are all completely free for you to look through in your own time, uh, take and integrate into your own work. At the uh, into your own workshops. Um, the final things I wanted to mention is how you can host training. So if you want to, as I say, invite Ensemble um, to deliver a workshop at your institute, um, then you can contact us on our help desk. So we have a dedicated help desk where you can ask questions about Ensemble in general, um, if you're using Ensemble, but also it's a place where you can get in touch with us if you want to request a, either an in-person or a virtual workshop. Some people contact us with very specific ideas about the types of workshops that they would like. Um, whereas some people are just generally interested in hosting workshops. So please feel free to contact us on the help desk, even with just a general inquiry. We, we can talk to you about the different formats and lengths of workshops that are possible that we can deliver for you. Um, and there's information here about the different learning objectives and the different types of courses that we generally run. Um, the final thing um, is uh, tra uh, attending training. So here you can find information about the different um, training that we provide. So as well as the in-person and the virtual live training, we also have um, online workshops. So you can use the um, EBI um, training portal that Anna described to you, uh, where you can go and find um, on-demand training uh, for online courses that Ensemble obviously contributes to that platform and that resource as well. Um, and then we also have um, a YouTube channel, which I can show you. So. If you click on train online, the blue bar at the top, you can see that as well as the on EBI online courses, uh, we also have a YouTube channel. 
where you can find recorded um, tutorials, webinars, uh, and even previous courses as well. So again, you can integrate some of our recordings into your own training if you want as well. They're all completely free for you to take and use in your own work, in your own workshops. If you do want to deliver your own training about Ensemble, then please do get in contact with us on the help desk as well. Um, and we'll try and provide any support or any information or share um, up-to-date materials with you that you might be interested in using. So with that, um, I'm going to finish now and hand over to Summer, who wants to talk to you about the Europe PMC training resources. Right. So thank you for the introduction. So I'm Summer Rosanowski, the Community Outreach Officer for Europe PMC. So today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Europe PMC and highlight the resources that we have available to help you with your training and teaching. So Europe PMC is an open database of scientific literature. It pro provides comprehensive access to life science literature from trusted sources. It's available to anyone, anywhere, and that's for free. So with Europe PMC, you can search and read over 41 million publications, preprints, and other documents such as protocols and books that are enriched with links to support data, reviews, protocols, and other relevant resources. So Europe PMC integrates the content from a range of sources such as PubMed, PubMed Central, Agrola, and 28 different life science preprint servers, including BioArchive, ResearchSquare, and preprints.org. Europe PMC is partnered with PubMed Central and endorsed and supported by a group of international science funders as their repository of choice. So Europe PMC offers an intuitive search for articles and preprints, and compared to other search engines, Europe PMC searches through both the abstract and full text for your keywords, rather than one or the other. And this allows you to find a greater number of relevant results. That's really especially helpful when writing literature reviews or researching a subject that may be a new area or a very niche area, as it will return you more relevant results. Europe PMC search functionality also allows you to limit your search to specific article sections, such as just searching in the methods or just in the figures to provide you a more powerful search. Europe PMC also enables you to access figures and data at your fingertips. It connects publications with high quality data in over 40 biological databases. This is so that you can examine the evidence behind scientific claims and for the reproducibility of results. You can also then use the advanced search options to search for data behind the publications and to find papers providing biological models, citing proteomics data sets, or describing protein structures. Europe PMC also has the research articles in Europe PMC are enriched with links to data behind the paper. So that could be protocols, smart citations, peer review materials, and more. And the preprint versions are also linked to each other. So where a preprint is uh, an article that hasn't gone through the traditional peer review process and is posted after it meets potentially a few short criteria like uh, not being your own work. So it has to be yours um, and some spell check and things. So going through uh, plagiarism and making sure it meets their requirements and it's posted within a few days and these are free to access. So these are then linked to each other. So when people update with a new version of their preprint, may that be following comments from the community, we will link to that. And then also if it becomes a journal published version of that, that's also linked where possible so that if you do see it, find the preprint, you'll be able to find that journal article as well very easily. So Europe PMC connects articles with underlying data in major biological databases. It identifies data citations, so that's including data DOIs or data accessions in the text of articles using text mining. So if data links are available for a number of different data sets, such as the European Nucleotide Archive, PDBE, PFAM, um, Interpro and Ensemble, then that will be linked within that article. So you can go directly to that database and see that data set there for more information. Europe PMC also links to articles that have been curated by databases. 
such as intact, flybase, or corresponding data records. So you can see where databases have used that research article to help inform people on a wider project. Um, so for flybase, they could have found out something about a particular protein for a fly that then may be on there. So you can go and see how that's been used and then also use that link to then get a bigger picture. And all the data um, in a, to a study can be found in the data section of the article in European C. So this also means that it enables an advanced search option. So these are data related searches and it allows you to search specific data sets, be that data types or even text mined annotations, which will highlight within the text different um, categories such as organisms, cell lines, gene mutations, protein interactions, or other insights found in the article text. Being able to use advanced search to search for specific data sets um, allows you to not need to use the syntax, which is shown here, so that you can do it without needing to know these for the main search. So it makes that simpler for you to search in these more complicated ways that will allow you to find more refined and relevant search results. So EuroPMC has a few different resources um, to help you when you're teaching or training. Um, you can use the Ember EBI on demand training shown by Anna, as well as going onto the outreach page, which the link is um, here, which I'll post into the chat afterwards. And you can go onto the website and you'll find a list just shown here of training resources. Uh, for example, European C, get the most from literature searches. There are also, we also have a YouTube page as well, similar to Ensemble. And you can go on there and there will be live recordings of webinars that we've done. And there you can have a look. And we also set up playlists to try and help you work through a problem. Um, and we're looking at expanding that over the coming years to create some bite-sized training and really expand on what we've got available for you there. Another option is also we do do publications. So recently we have just released a preprint and that contains 12 protocols that walk you through using Europe PMC to search and evaluate publications and preprints. And this covers finding an article on a topic of interest to refining results and then to finding the data behind the article. So the reason for this is to break down each of those sections and we will be doing uh, tutorials to kind of support these um, on social media as well on Twitter. Um, so that's another way that we'll try and give you this information in a different way for you to learn and then also reuse that. Uh, the final way, if you'd like to have further resources or you want to get some more information from us, is to contact us at the help desk or contact us on Twitter so that we can get back to you and see how we can assist you. So thank you very much. I'll hand back over to AJ for the questions. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so looking at questions in, in chat, um, also in Q&A box, there was one general question about uh, the recording. So I can say that the this webinar has been recorded and the recording will be made available on the webinar page and also on YouTube. And you will also get the link uh, to the recording by email by tomorrow. Um, and there was another general question about the certificates. So we have different uh, various forms of training. So I'll actually come to Anna for that first question. So do we provide certificate for all of our, our training or do some? Yeah, so the face-to-face um, -face and week-long virtual courses that I mentioned that have the um, restricted numbers that you, you need to apply for, those do have certificates for them. For our webinars and e-learning, we don't give certificates, uh, but the alternative um, we do have is that for anyone who attends a webinar, you will receive an email that says that you attended, essentially, um, that uh, it says sort of, thanks for, for attending this webinar, so you could use that as, as some proof. Um, and also for our e-learning, as I showed before, it where it's possible to register for our site and track your learning. You then have that My Learning page, um, which shows uh, all of the online tutorials that you've completed or the webinars that you've watched. Um, so that page could be used to, to show some proof as, as to your completion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was another general question, and I think everyone can probably address that. There were questions about how often the training pages are or these resource pages uh, get updated. 
uh, and people were also interested in like uh, jobs and internships, how often they are updated on, on your pages. So if I can start with you, Anna. Yeah, so I talk about the training pages. Um, so it's really important for us to keep the materials that we have up to date and useful and relevant for everyone. And so um, we basically review all of our content uh, once a year. Um, and throughout the year, we obviously have new content, uh, but everything is reviewed within a, a yearly cycle to make sure that it is up to date and useful for you. Um, in terms of internship, I, I dropped a link in uh, to, to some of the questions um, in the Q&A box to, to take you to some information about internships. It's not something that the training team um, is particularly uh, involved in, but there's some information there for you. Yeah, same question for you, Ben. Um, so the Ensemble um, and Ensemble Genomes resources are updated every three to four months. So we have a release cycle uh, when new data um, is integrated into our interfaces and some of the some of the views are updated and, and improved as well based on feedback. Um, so in terms of the training that we deliver and the materials, um, we regularly go through our training to see whether um, a new release has um, altered the walkthroughs, the demos or the exercises that we provide. Um, and that's why, um, as I showed you um, when we were looking at the training exercises that we have available online, um, we always associate them with a particular release number. So at the moment, Ensemble is in release 108. So any training materials that we create um, according to the current release, we will tag with the Ensemble release 108 so that people know that that exercise or that walkthrough corresponds with the release from the current day. Um, obviously, um, we in two or three months when we create a new version based on the next release, um, we will tag that with 109. So you can always go to things for posterity and to, to obviously see if it's not the current release, you can do your own updates if you're trying to integrate them into your own training. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Summer, any comment on that? Yeah, so for Europe PMC, we update our materials. We review them yearly, but if there's any big changes on let's say how our search is working, um, we'd update that on Twitter. We'd also then produce some training materials and make sure that they're all up to date to reflect those changes. And to touch on the internship um, question, um, I know Europe PMC have had interns previously in years before. So if that was something that you were interested in, um, message to our help desk or message us on Twitter and we could have a chat to see if there's any possibility of that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's another question uh, for you, Ben. You mentioned that uh, that uh, people can actually contact Ensemble if they want to organize workshops at their own institute or they want some training. Uh, so how does it actually work in terms of funding or you could also organize courses virtually or it has to be face-to-face? -face. Do you have any comment? Yeah, so the Ensemble um, training uh, and I guess for other EPI resources as well is, is free um, in the way that we don't charge host institutes um, for actually delivering the workshop. Um, but we do ask that the hosts cover the costs of travel and accommodation um, of a traveling trainer. So um, if I was to, for example, get invited to go to Germany for a workshop, um, that would require the cost of the, the flights, um, any ground transport, um, a meal, if perhaps I was staying overnight, and then also the stay in the hotel that I needed. Um, for virtual training, that obviously is not the case. There's no costs associated with traveling. So we can offer virtual training um, for no cost. There is some um, budget available within the Ensemble project for delivering training in low and middle income countries. Um, that's more um, discussed on a case by case basis, depending on the size of the training and the distance and uh, lots of other factors as well. So. If you are interested in, in hosting training, um, but you don't have any budget available, then please do still get in contact with us and we can um, via the Ensemble Help Desk and we can discuss the most appropriate training format uh, and the most appropriate budget options that we have for, for training. Great, thank you. Uh, for the next question, I'll come to you, Anna. So you mentioned about online uh, tutorials. The uh, question is, um, 
what's the best way to reach out to authors or, or trainers of that tutorial if anybody has any question okay um so if you're keen to get an answer uh, to a question that's just about a specific resource um, that you've completed an online tutorial for really the best way is to go via the help desk for that resource um, because you're going to uh, have that question go to the the most relevant person to to answer it um, and also you're going to go to to the person that's around to answer it because um, it's entirely possible that uh, the person who authored it may not may not still uh, be working for the resource so absolutely the help desk for that resource is the place to go to if you have a more general question about training uh, the train online at ebi.ac.com uk um email address that i mentioned before is also a great place to to come to um, because that will come to ajay and i and we'll be able to forward on your question to the most relevant person but certainly as a first step the um the resources help desk would be the place to go yeah. uh next question i'll come to summer um so uh all the publications that are available at EuroPMC, they're all free access? Yep, so they're all free access, they're all open access for you to um, look at EuroPMC. There will at least be the abstract. Uh, for some of them, we don't have the full text. So we have a full open access subset where we will have all the full text. And then you can also use the API if you are using programmatic access to also pull all of those. For some, we may have the abstract and not the full text, but on paywall have the full text, so we'll link you to them. So on paywall is a database that will look for the full text anywhere and pull it through them. So we can also give it that way. Otherwise, if it's not there, you'll need to go and message the author of that paper. Uh, and there's one question which came in, I think it's more about acknowledging using any um, resource or tool. So while creating a data set, do we also have to mention about the analytical tools we have used such as company's name so i guess if you are using uh, in in terms of training online tutorial or if you are using a tool from ensemble how do people acknowledge it in their their own work uh, so in in relation to ensemble um the the best practice is to um, cite the ensemble publication so uh, Ensemble has an annual publication in NAR, the Nucleic Acids Research Journal, um, where we um, give information about the latest updates, but citing that is probably the most appropriate um, way to cite Ensemble in general. Um, if you've used specific tools, then we do also have publications around some of our um, different data types and specific tools that we have available through our interfaces. So you can also find the more specific paper if that's relevant for your um, the work that you've performed and, and the, the data, the tools that you've used. Um, the other thing that's quite useful when you are um, citing Ensemble in your work is to um, mention the release number. Um, as I've mentioned, Ensemble updates every two to three months with new data. So um, for in terms of people being able to replicate your analysis and your um, the, the data and regenerate the data that you've created, um, have, making reference to a specific Ensemble release is obviously going to be helpful um for people to do that um just to add to so i was having a look at this question and i didn't know whether it was about um data submission uh instead as well so if you're submitting um a data set so it says creating a data set maybe it's submitting um do you have to mention which tools you've used to produce the, the data set and ultimately it depends on what kind of data it is and, and what kind of uh, tools you're meaning um but each resource that allows submission has very clear guidelines as to what data you submit and the date and the metadata required to submit um but if you're ever unsure and you're trying to submit data um do you again contact the contact uh as the help desk um, because the by curators and the help desk will be there to, to help answer your questions because they want to help you submit your data. 